Hi, and welcome to this news literacy lesson on news versus opinion. Within the journalism neighborhood, there are two sub neighborhoods, if you will. In one part of town, there is the there is news, there's reporting that is meant to inform us. But also living in that same neighborhood, but a different section of it is opinion, commentary. Here's where the authors, the speakers, attempt to persuade us. Now this distinction is often difficult to find. And there's no small amount of confusion among the news consuming public about whether what they're consuming is meant to strictly inform them with the facts or whether it is opinion that is meant to make an argument for something. Pew Research back in 2018 tried this uh, experiment where they gave participants in this survey a number of factual statements, five factual statements to be specific, and five opinion statements, and tried to see who could tell them apart. Now, among the participants, a minority of all of them were able to spot all five factual statements. As you see there, only 26% were able to spot five factual statements, whereas 35% were able to spot all five opinion statements. So simply telling an opinion statement from a factual statement may be challenging in and of itself. And then we're, when we're in the journalism neighborhood and say watching a cable news program and there's a reporter at the table and there's a commentator at the table and they're talking over one another, that makes it even more difficult to make the distinction when we're trying to consume news. Now there is some hope within this study. It turns out that those who are more politically aware, they keep up with politics to an, to an extent and understand the way the uh, American system of government works. They're more digitally savvy. And it turns out that those who have some trust, some faith in the news media uh, fare better and are better able to spot factual statements and tell them apart from opinion statements. So our goal here today overall is to help you tell the difference between news reporting and opinion journalism. So these are our specific outcomes. Distinguish between news and opinion, both of which are in the journalism neighborhood, and understand why their differences matter. Second, understand why both news and opinion must adhere to the journalistic standards of verification, independence, and accountability. Yes, even if somebody's trying to persuade us, even if somebody is giving their opinion, we should expect them to live up to these standards, to verify their takes with facts, to keep a, an independent distance from the subjects they're covering, and to be, and to be accountable, correct errors, and be open about who they are and any potential conflicts of interest. Three, distinguish between news and opinion by paying attention to labels and language. A lot of news outlets, especially legacy ones, ones that started off as newspapers and now have newspapers and websites or just websites, uh, do try to have clear labeling for news versus opinion. So we'll look at how to tell them apart. But in the absence of labels or with unclear labels, there are also some clues we can look for and listen for as we're trying to tell the difference between news and opinion. And finally, recognize that opinion journalism, when done well, has its benefits, especially when consumed along with impartial news reporting. Opinion journalism is almost by definition selective. Somebody's going to select evidence to support their argument. So having a more well-rounded understanding of the news of the day, what's going on in the world, will help you spot whether an opinion journalist argument holds water.
So let's again start with the basics and define our terms. What is opinion journalism? This is when the author or the speaker shares and explains their view, their judgment, or appraisal on a particular subject. In other words, it is, say, an opinion columnist who puts their name to their piece and says, here's what I think about, you know, pick your subject. Here's what I think about immigration, gun control, war and peace, climate change, what have you. But it's the creator of that column, that commentary, that is giving their opinion. So I stress that point because news reports will often turn to sources that give their opinion. They include the opinions of sources, say it's a, it's a political campaign, and of course the candidate and their surrogates are going to give their opinion about who's the best candidate. And that's okay to include that in the story as long as the journalist, the reporter doing the interviews, isn't giving their opinion as well. If that were the case, then we'd be in the, on the opinion side. But the inclusion of opinion in a story does not automatically make it opinion journalism. It's opinion journalism when the author or speaker is giving their opinion. If a, a reporter goes to an expert and asks for their expert opinion on a subject, that does not make the piece a work of opinion journalism. How do we tell them apart? Well, there is this basic distinction. The goal of news reporting is simple. It's to inform us. Here's what happened, who was involved, where did it take place, when did it take place. It's informing us about information we're interested in or that's important that may affect our lives. The goal of opinion journalism, on the other hand, it can be informative but it's also there to persuade us. The author, the speaker, is trying to demonstrate that they have the correct position on an issue. Somebody says that the U.S. say should not have withdrawn from Afghanistan, right? They're trying to persuade you that they're right. Or, of course, from the other side, someone defends that position, defends that decision. They're trying to persuade you, the news consumer, that they're right. So that's a, a major difference between news reporting, which is meant to inform us, give us news we can use, help us understand our world a little bit better. Opinion journalism ideally informs us as well, but also it comes from an opinion journalist who's trying to bring us to their side. Here's what I think about an issue, and here's why I'm right. That's where the opinion journalist comes from. It's important to note that many news outlets continue to separate news reporting from their opinion. If you go to the website or get a physical copy of the Boston Globe, for example, as you see, there's a clearly labeled opinion section. It says it clear as day right at the top of the page. And it breaks down opinion into different categories. There's letters. Those are letters from us, from the consumers. There's editorials. There's co uh, columns what they call ideas, and then there is the news section. It intends to inform us, give us details on the news of the day. In fact, recently, a number of reporters, so these are reporters who try to inform, who go out, do interviews, collect evidence, and try to inform us, they produce news reports. A number of reporters wrote a letter to the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. So they wrote a letter to their employer critiquing the approach of the opinion section of the Wall Street Journal, saying that many of the opinion pieces were playing fast and loose with the facts, were misleading, they did not, uh, they were not open about conflicts of interest by the authors. And they wanted the publisher to more clearly distinguish between the news side of the Wall Street Journal and the opinion side. Because their jobs are, are different, and they do answer to different editors within the Wall Street Journal. Now, though the first response from the Wall Street Journal's publisher was kind of dismissive to what 
the reporters were concerned about. They did produce this page on their website, the Wall Street Journal website, to try to help us, the consumers, distinguish between news and opinion at the Wall Street Journal. So here's how they put it. We draw a clear line between news and opinion. The separation between these two independent departments, meaning they don't work together, they work separately, helps ensure impartiality in our news reporting and freedom of perspective in our opinion pieces. So that's what they're hoping to achieve with this separation. Impartiality in news reporting, where they try to give us the facts as best they know them without necessarily taking sides in contentious debates. Whereas on the opinion side, it's preferable to have freedom of perspective. Somebody is free to give their opinion without feeling the pressure to suppress it. And they also note on the same page on the Wall Street Journal's website, some other signs that will help you distinguish between the news side and the opinion side. They note that news articles show the default WSJ, lo WSJ logo. Check this section label and headline. News articles show a blue label and standard text headline. Check the byline. News articles include an italic byline positioned below the centerpiece photo. Now, I don't know why the, the clues have to be so subtle, um, and not all of them are. They're also just simple, clear labels. WSJ opinion. Opinion pieces show a gold opinion logo. Opinion pieces show a gold label and italic headline. As you see, not only does it say opinion at the top of the web page, but it also says opinion above the story's headline. Check the byline. That's the credited author. Opinion bylines include an image of the author and are positioned above the centerpiece photo. And also check the bottom of the article. Some opinion pieces feature an about this article section at the bottom to provide details about the column and author. So there are several signs that are meant to help you distinguish. Some of them may be too subtle to notice. Who's paying att much attention to what words are italicized in a news article? But something like the label opinion right above the piece should be a clear indicator. Now, unlike the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and other newspapers, some news outlets always take sides. They may do original reporting, like they uncover new evidence, talk to sources, and reveal new information. But even when they report on a subject, they are providing opinion. They are doing so from their particular perspective. And here are two examples, The Daily Caller and Jacobin. Jacobin, on their About page, tells us where this particular website is coming from. They say it's a leading voice of the American left, offering socialist perspectives on politics, economics, and culture. The print magazine is released quarterly and reaches 50,000 subscribers in addition to a web audience of over 2 million a month. So, having seen this on the About page, we should understand that Jacobin, even if a piece of theirs isn't clearly labeled opinion, everything in this magazine, everything on their website is from this socialist perspective that they describe here. So they don't draw that distinction, whereas the Wall Street Journal and Boston Globe tried to separate news from opinion. The Daily Caller, for its part, tells us this on their About page. Founded in 2010 by Tucker Carlson, so that gives you a sense of, if you know anything about Tucker Carlson, that gives you a sense of the political perspective of the Daily Caller. And Neil Patel, former chief Advo policy advisor to VP Dick Cheney, um, he was or the uh, vice president of George W. Bush, Republican. So they're up front, too, about their perspective. So even if it's in a news story that's informing us, the Daily Caller has adopted a political agenda, just as the Jack, uh, Jacobin has an opposing political agenda. And pretty much everything you read on their websites will be filtered through that particular agenda. 
Now, making it more difficult for us is that some news outlets routinely blur the lines between news and opinion. Now, look at this image from Jake Tapper's program on CNN. Jake Tapper is on the left. He's the host of this CNN program. Sitting closest to him is Maggie Haberman, a news reporter, political correspondent for the New York Times. Her job is not to offer opinion, but her job day to day is to report on politics, report on the White House. Now, Jake Tapper himself does kind of present himself as more of an impartial journalist, but he does often comment sarcastically on the news, will weigh in with his opinions and own commentary. Even further muddying the waters here, who's sitting next to Maggie Haberman? There's Bill Kristol, who uh, used to be uh, a, a speechwriter for Republican politicians and a publisher of a conservative magazine. And next to him is Paul Begala, who used to work on the campaign of Bill Clinton, a Democrat. So you have all these voices mixing together. And when they're in the same room and they're all, all talking and talking over one another, how are we supposed to tell whether, wait, that's meant to just inform me. No, wait, that's supposed to persuade me. Is it persuasive? So it can get confusing as those lines blur. So given the challenges and potential confusion of having an opinion section in the journalism neighborhood, it's fair to ask, why have it at all? What's its value? But maybe worth reminding you here that the tradition of opinion journalism is even longer uh, than the tradition of attempting to report on the news in an impartial manner. You may recall that the first newspapers in the United States were controlled by political parties to serve their uh, political agendas. Only later, in the middle of the 1800s, do some news outlets purport to be more neutral, more impartial, and really not until the middle of the 20th century have news outlets really thoroughly embraced that notion that there should be a separation between opinion and news. So why keep opinion around? Well, there may be a number of reasons, and perhaps you can think of some others. It gives insights into complicated stories. You know, some columnists, some commentators are subject area experts in what they're commenting on. Like they're an economist, they're an historian, they're a social scientist. You know, whatever their relevant area of expertise, they can give you insights that a reporter who is you know, trying to get information and convey the opinions of others can't quite give you. It can open your eyes to new ways of looking at the world. A uh, particularly well done piece of opinion journalism can you know, really open our eyes to a new perspective, help us think in new ways, and even you know, help us understand you know, the opposing side. Right? In this sense, this third point, it can challenge our assumptions taking a look at opinions that we expect we won't agree with. Maybe they're worth considering, even if it's more comforting to ignore their existence. Consider other opinions, challenge our assumptions. Even if it doesn't change our minds, it could still at least strengthen our critical thinking muscles. And help us develop our own points of view, giving us uh, ammunition for arguments with our families uh, during the holiday holidays. Help us, you know, firm up our belief, our perspective on the world with, ideally, you know, good evidence and solid logic. Now, opinion journalism has the most value, we would argue, when it is consumed along with news reporting. So we have a broader base of knowledge and then supplement that with opinion. We can better make sense of those opinions. We can better evaluate 
how convincing and reliable those opinions are. For example, take a look at these uh, different examples of opinion pieces. One is from the Wall Street Journal, and one is from the Washington Post. The piece from the Washington, uh, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal by Jason Riley, a more conservative commentator. And so his piece tries to make the case that there is not a need for stricter gun regulations. There is not evidence that racism in policing and law enforcement is, he, he says it's an exaggerated problem. On the other hand, Radley Balco, the columnist at the Washington Post who specializes in criminal justice, says in, his, in, the, in the very title of his piece, there's overwhelming evidence that the criminal justice system is racist. Here's the proof. Now, he says there's proof, but it's up to us to evaluate it because, remember, Radley Balco is trying to convince us, trying to persuade us that he has the correct position. Riley has an opposing position, and you know, we can turn to his piece in the Wall Street Journal and compare and contrast and evaluate the opposing arguments. Who has the better evidence? Who made a better case for the problem or the lack of a problem of racism in policing? So how do we go about evaluating the quality of opinion journalism? Well, the same way we would go about evaluating journalism in general. Look for VIA. Look for verification. In fact, the Society of Professional Journalists, which is the largest professional organization for journalists in the United States, has its own code of conduct, and they weigh in on a proper approach to opinion journalism. And they relate very much, they very much align with our notions of VIA. So under verification, they say analysis and commentary should not misrepresent fact or context. Right? If someone is making a case uh, for you know, more environmental regulations or uh, a, a freer immigration system, they should not support their perspective with lies. They should not take data, images, documents out of their proper context. In other words, they should stick to verification, proper verification. Now, the second one may seem an odd expectation, independence. How could someone who's giving me their opinion practice independence? Does that make sense? Well, in this sense, the Society of Professional Journalists recommends that even opinion journalists should deny favored treatment to advertisers and special interests and remain free of associations and activities that may compromise integrity or damage credibility. You know, even if there is a political commentator who you know, we, we know what position he's going to take, he's a consistent supporter of this particular politician's policies, and we can set our watch to it, it is predictable. Still, it would be a violation of independence for that person to then go work on the campaign of that politician. They should at least maintain some separation and try their best to come to their conclusions, to their arguments, honestly, free as possible from outside influence. And then there's accountability. Analysis and commentary should be labeled. Now, not all opinion pieces have a specific byline. Newspapers, for example, have editorials which are unsigned and are supposed to you know, reflect the opinion of the editorial board as a collective. So not every opinion piece may have a specific byline, but it should be clearly labeled as opinion, and if it's unsigned, labeled as editorial. So what do we do? Well, look for verification and opinion. Now, at the end of the reading the piece, you may not agree with it, 
but at least give the author their due that they have marshaled some evidence in support of their position and are trying to persuade you. So take a look at this one. Opinion Democrats can't back down on the minimum wage. So this digital opinions editor is saying that Democrats should continue to fight for the minimum wage. That's an important policy that they should try to achieve. Of course, there are different opinions about this. Some say the minimum wage should stay where it is. Some, some would even say get rid of the minimum wage entirely. But this opinion author is saying Democrats can't back down. Keep pushing for it. Try to achieve this policy. But what does he say about it? He says the policy case for a $15 minimum wage has never been stronger. Opponents will point to a particular study saying that it would cost jobs. But then says, but the most comprehensive review of studies on the subject found that on average, a higher minimum wage's effects on jobs would be negligible and the benefits are undeniable. Even the Congressional Budget Office found that a $15 minimum wage will boost paychecks for 17 million people and lift 900,000 out of poverty. So he's providing some data, providing some evidence. You may not be convinced. You may be worried about those job losses. But at least he's making a good faith effort to say, hey, listen to this. I have a position and it's worth considering. And then he goes on to talk about the politics of it, saying that it would be a winner for Democrats who he's kind of informally advising here. Poll after poll, poll shows about two thirds of Americans support the $15 minimum wage, including unusually strong support among Republicans. The same Florida electorate that gave Donald Trump a comfortable win also passed the $15 minimum wage with 61% of the vote. So he's trying to make a, a policy case for it, lift people out of poverty, raise people's wages, but also saying that Democrats would be wise politically because it's popular policy. Now again, you may not be convinced, but this is what we mean when we say look for verification and opinion. Do they try to support their opinions with evidence, with data? with the opinions of experts. Look for independence. Make sure that opinion journalists do not have conflicts of interest. They shouldn't just serve as a, a mouthpiece for a private company or a government agency or a political party. So here's a good point to draw a distinction between opinion journalism versus informed advocacy. Now, there are a lot of informative websites out there run by organizations. Some are activist organizations like the Environmental Defense Fund or Union of Concerned Scientists where they are concerned with policies, whether it's environmental protection or, or, or better scientific practices. And then there are also think tanks like the Hoover Institution and Heritage Foundation, where they do their own research, you know, have, have experts within the think tank to do that research and write up, uh, write up their conclusions. But all of these groups are also agenda driven. Whereas an opinion journalist is working for an independent news outlet, separate from groups like this. In fact, journalists should avoid direct ties to groups like this, should not be you know, uh, paid by the Environmental Defense Fund at the same time that they're doing opinion for the New York Times, for example. So in these cases, informed advocacy, they're driven first by a cause. They want to achieve these policy goals, and they'll do research to serve that cause. Opinion journalism ideally should be driven, guided by evidence to support a variety of opinions and perspectives. So that's a question to ask when it comes to independence in opinion journalism. Does the opinion journalist work for an independent news outlet you know, as opposed to an advocacy group or a, a partisan think tank, that includes a variety of viewpoints. 
For example, if you look at the opinion page of USA Today, why is there systemic racism in Democrat-run cities? Americans want to, want to know what's made in America. Look at canceled internships as an opportunity. Con condemn police, not George Floyd protesters. Set racism, brutality on fire, not buildings. So a number of different perspectives on police conduct, on police brutality, on the protests. Some pointing the finger at Democrats, some pointing the finger at the police, some defending the protesters. So a variety of opinions. In fact, the USA Today has published opinion pieces by presidents. And then in the same edition of the newspaper have people criticizing the president. Does the journalist maintain intellectual independence? On your screen, you see Jamel Bowie. He is an opinion columnist for the New York Times. He typically takes more liberal positions on a variety of issues, but he's not affiliated, he's not associated with the Democratic Party. In fact, there's the title of one of his pieces, The Trouble with Biden. You know, if somebody is just a party hack, they're not going to deviate at all from the party line. They're going to follow the dictates of a political party or whoever is paying them. Now, uh, an independent columnist, an independent journalist, is free to deviate from the expected position, even if it might alienate people in their own camp. On the other side, Nicole Wallace was a, a top operative for the for the Republican Party, a speechwriter, um, and then became one of the chief critics of the Republican Party under Donald Trump, and then moved, uh, got a program on MSNBC. If she were a part of the Republican Party, she would not have had the freedom to then, on her own program, attack that party that she used to be deeply involved with. So that's intellectual independence at work. If someone else is pulling the strings, then these opinion journalists would be expected at all times to toe the party line. Now, there are cautionary examples out there. Does the journalist avoid direct ties to partisans? Do they have conflicts of interest? Well, it turns out that during Bernie Sanders' run for the Democratic nomination for president, he had on his staff somebody who at the same time was writing opinion pieces for The Guardian and other news outlets. And that author had not informed his, his employers in the news industry that he was at the same time working for the Bernie Sanders campaign. That's a conflict of interest. And then eventually he left his journalistic posts and went to work for the Sanders campaign full time. And now he has his own kind of independent uh, Substack operation where people can subscribe to his newsletter. Sean Hannity and a few other of the Fox opinion hosts have very cozy relationships with former President Donald Trump. Sean Hannity and Janine Pirro appeared on stage with Donald Trump at a campaign event, at a rally. That's a clear violation of journalistic independence that even opinion journalists should follow. Sean Hannity appeared in uh, ads for Donald Trump's campaign. These are the kind of direct ties to partisans that even opinion journalists should avoid. More recently, uh, Chris Cuomo, the brother of former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who has a, uh, a popular evening program on CNN, it turns out while Andrew Cuomo, the governor, was being investigated for corruption, for sexual harassment of his staffers, his brother, Chris Cuomo was advising him, was advising his brother 
on how to respond to those allegations, to those charges. A clear conflict of interest. And prior to this, Governor Cuomo had appeared on his brother's CNN program for interviews. And they had kind of, you know, brotherly back, back and forth. That's inadvisable. That violates professional ethics. And Chris Cuomo did apologize, but uh, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. So these are cautionary examples. Journalists, even opinion journalists, should not be cozying up to partisans, to think tanks, to activist groups, even if it's in, the, it's in one's own family. And then look for accountability, clear labeling and opinion. Most websites follow the kind of old newspaper model where there's an opinion section that you click on and you see the various labels, whether it's a review, whether it's uh, an, uh, an editorial, whether it's a column, whatever the case may be. Those kinds of things should appear in the opinion section and be kept separate from the straight news reporting. 